Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the DevNet Create Theater. Uh, next up, uh, we have Rosemary Wang from ThoughtWorks, who's going to be talking to us about treating the network as a container. So, Rosemary, thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. This is uh, it's late in the day, so I appreciate you all being here. Is everybody ca caffeinated or, you know, you've gotten some tea? Okay, good. Great. Uh, yeah, so there was supposed to be a different talk at this time. It was the script apocalypse. I can't say it really well, but I tried, so great. But uh, unfortunately, it was canceled, so they moved me up. So if you're interested in learning about how to treat a network as a container, stick around. Otherwise, I, I leave you to get more tea or coffee, whatever your poison. So why do I say how to treat a network as a container or get really close? Well, that's because you can't really treat a network like a I guess a Docker container, but you can get pretty close, right? Who am I to tell you this? I'm a little weird, I'm a little quirky. Uh, I'm a platform and infrastructure consultant at ThoughtWorks. If you've ever heard of ThoughtWorks, they're usually this big think tank for a lot of different application development theories and practices. So you hear a lot about 12 factor, you hear about testing, uh, and I actually joined them specifically for platform and infrastructure. So it's a little weird, I'm a operator, uh, that is amongst developers, so kind of throwing me into the lion's den there. My handle is Jack of All Trades, Master of None. That's the acronym, 08. You can find me on GitHub, Twitter, and Medium with the same exact handle. So always remember Jack of All Trades, Master of None. This talk actually started about two years ago, which is really long for a talk, right? Things change a lot. So when it started two years ago, I was actually at an organization trying to undergo digital transformation. It's a beautiful, beautiful hashtag that you'll find a lot on Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, your favorite places. And during this time, I realized that digital transformation is a spectrum. You're not going to have all parts of your infrastructure fully automated, but you're also not going to have all parts of your in infrastructure manual or regressive, which is one term for it. But the reality is that your infrastructure will kind of sit somewhere in the middle, and you don't really know. Some devices might not be fully automated at all. Now, I started actually in the compute space. I was what they called a cloud DevOps engineer. Who's heard of that? I don't know. I didn't know at the time what it meant when they told me that that was my job title. I still don't know what it really means, but the idea was that I worked specifically on compute. I worked on cloud resources, provisioning virtual machines, and eventually containers. And to me, the compute space was great because containers two years ago was like really actually budding and you know in production. And the agility that I got from making containers a reality was actually fascinating to me. I thought it was amazing. I could do whatever I wanted to with these containers. And the container value proposition was to build, ship, and run. I could build it on my laptop and give it to my friend. If I wanted to ship it, put it in production, I could put it in a pipeline, deploy it really easily. It was standardized, it was isolated, it was modular. It was packaged with all the dependencies I needed. And I could run it really easily as well, right? If you wanna upgrade a container, don't do it in place. Just destroy it and bring it back up, very immutable. And eventually, I got picked up like a feral wolf puppy onto the network team. They were like, wow, you're a developer. Come help us develop on the network. And I was terrified, OK? I actually came from an electrical engineering background where my background was legitimately in networking. But I was still terrified, because I had never touched an enterprise network. And when I found the enterprise network, I really wasn't sure what to do with it. I mean, I didn't really know what state it was in. All I heard was, it's very manual. There are 99 problems. And somehow, all of them had to do with terminology, it had to do with APIs that were maybe non-standardized. It was extremely distributed. Protocols are specialized, right? Different vendors have come up with different protocols, and the result is that it's pretty specialized. So I was really intimidated going into it. And it wasn't until much later, probably about a year ago, that I realized the reason why the network is so complex is because it's actually three domains. It's connectivity, the way things communicate. It's service discovery, how does something identify itself? And it's policy, how do things not talk to each other? So with these three domains, on top of that, each of these three domains are divided into three types, which gets even worse. Your physical devices can be fairly manual. Depends on what they are, right? 
But then you've got dynamic infrastructure, and this is what my colleague Keith Morris calls uh, you know, more public cloud-related infrastructure. So that's your AWS VPCs, that's your Azure VNets. But there's also software-defined X in that kind of dynamic infrastructure range. And those are pretty well automated, but there are some pieces that might be more manual. And then there are containers. Container networking was made to be consumed by the developer. So the constructs are even different. The way you approach container networking, while the concepts are generally the same, the language is very different. So then you've got nine basically subsets of problems that you divide your 99 problems across. And that's what makes this space so frustrating. So what do you do? How do you build, ship, and run a network? Well, you test it. Why? Well, after you build the network, you test it. After you ship it and move it to production, you test it. After you upgrade it, you test it. Test all the things. Everybody has seen this, right? Automate all the things. And it's not about automating all the things, because all the things change. Your vendors will change. Your protocols will change. Your technologies will constantly change. But you know what your network is supposed to do. You know what your infrastructure is supposed to do. Test everything. So what I'm going to give to you in this presentation is how to build, ship, and run your network and how you can facilitate that with testing and pipelines. I, I internally cringe at pipelines, but don't worry. We're going to dumb it down so we can all understand what it means. All right, the testing pyramid. How many people in here have heard about the testing pyramid before? OK, we've got some people. All right, testing pyramid was something I borrowed out of the application development space. It lends very well to this. Starting at the bottom, you've got unit tests. Those are really simple tests. They're isolated. They validate your configuration, validate functionally if things are the way you expect them to be doing. Service contract tests are next up. Service contracts evaluate your interactions, inputs and outputs. Integration tests confirm the interaction. And end-to-end, -end, I like to think, are the real deal. Now, why is it shaped like a pyramid? The idea is that as you go up the pyramid, the cost of running that test increases in both time money, and resource, right? So when you actually run your end-to-end -end test, that's very expensive. You might need real devices to do that. Versus your unit tests, you can try to do it locally. You know, that's a possibility. At the very top, you'll notice there's something even worse. It's the manual test. It's a giant cloud. These are exploratory. There's a lot of overhead. There's really not too much you can do to automate them, right? Well, in infrastructure, and in particular networking, we have the testing signpost. So you have your end-to-end -end tests, maybe, for the most part. When you're starting your automation journey, you'll might, you might have some subset of that. And then you have a lot of manual tests, so the cost is very high. This is why you have like 24-hour change windows just to determine if a switch has been configured correctly. Or you have maybe four-hour change windows to determine if, I don't know, your firewall policy is correct. So manual tests are the killer. They are extremely costly. They're very, very expensive. So taking this cons into consideration, what can you do during your build stage, right? When you're, when you're building your network, what can you do? How do you test that? Well, I'm not going to go into how to build, because many more experts have done it. Um, a lot of them are probably here at this conference, and I highly recommend you uh, look into it with them. But what I will talk about is how do you test it afterward? Or what are some ways that you can think about fitting it into this framework? So I like using given when thens. Given when thens to me are very logical, but they also express events. They also express what happens during automation. So given I have a component to automate, when some event happens, then the component should be configured. Simple, right? It's setup, automation, and test. What we're going to focus on is more of the then, but let me get into a more specific case of that then. Let's look in connectivity. Pretty typical case, right? I need to add a container network to a switch. Maybe you have a container network, has to route down to the underlay somehow, who knows? So I need to route my container network. Given I have a gateway to my data center, when I create a container network, network named DevNet with subnet, I'm not gonna say that all out because that's wasting a lot, but then I should set up a network, a route from that network to my data center. So that's a given, when, and then. And like I said, let's focus on that then. The then is I should set up a route from that network to my data center. If you're interested in the example, it's actually on GitHub. 
So you can take a look, the whole end-to-end -end examples on there. This is actually what it looks like under the hood. I won't go too far into it. I have a lot of blog posts that kind of delve behind the demo of what this was. But basically, what I'm trying to focus on is this bottom, these two boxes down here. The idea is that when I can create a container network, I want to be able to configure my open V switch on both of these hosts with a tunnel, and my container one and container two can talk to each other. That's it. I just want container one and container two to talk to each other. Is this something you do in production? No, but I needed a toy example that's vendor agnostic, cloud agnostic, and you can do this all locally, which is magic. But it uses Vagrant by in the hood, and if you're interested in the actual automated piece to do the network creation, that's actually using a console backend, and the console backend goes to an ans triggers an Ansible playbook runner, a little container that runs the playbooks against these two hosts remotely. So a little bit complicated, but we're focusing on those two turquoise boxes at the bottom. All right, so what does this look like under the hood? Well, I mentioned I'm using Vagrant, so my gateway is uh, basically a Vagrant machine that I built myself. It has open vSwitch on it, and it has Docker. It's a mock virtual device. I didn't want to put in a switch because the idea is I want you to be able to do this locally. When I create a container network named DevNet, that is actually me manu manually or through API triggering a Docker network create, and behind the scene, that actually triggers an Ansible playbook with console, a console watcher triggering an Ansible playbook. So that's automated, right? But I want to make sure that that's actually automated because it's magic, right? Under the hood, I don't know what's going on. So I need to test that. That's where my then comes in. Then I should set up a route from that network to my data center. That is what I call a smoke test. What I'll do in this smoke test is actually spin up container one, container two, and see if they can reach each other. And the idea behind the smoke test is I can take it and I can apply it to anything else that has Open vSwitch and Docker on it and has that very similar configuration. So what does this look like if I plop this all into the testing pyramid, right? I've got my unit tests. My unit tests will just check my Open vSwitch playbook. I have that playbook and I just wanna make sure it runs. That's it, I don't really mind if it's you know, from an integration standpoint, if it interacts properly, I just care if it runs to completion. So I'm gonna unit test that, and there's some linting that I've thrown in there too, because no one wants to sit there and like parse between spaces and tabs, I'm telling you now. As you go up, you've got service contract tests. Service contract tests are interesting. They're very unique because infrastructure doesn't tend to have them very clearly defined. But in this case, I wanted to make sure that the output of my console handler that actually triggers my Ansible playbook is actually properly triggering what my Ansible playbook expects. So does the actual output of my console container and my console automation actually match what I expect to go into my playbook? That's what my contract test does. Then I've got an integration test. What the integration test will do is actually spin up the two Vagrant hosts locally and then actually run this whole set of automation. It'll create the network and then it will spin up those two containers and then smoke test between them. And at the top, end-to-end -end tests. It would be the same as integration if I actually had a real device. So if I decided to put this in you know, Amazon or Azure or Google on an instance, I want to be able to just smoke test the same way. So the idea is that as you go up the pyramid, uh, each of these actually run longer and longer as you go up the pyramid. Um, so unit tests run fairly quickly, but the remainder run very, very slowly because they're very, they're very expensive. So a list of tools just for your edification. It's a lot. Vagrant, Ansible, Python, PyTest, Behave, and Makefile. Uh, so all of these things you can find in that GitHub. All right, so what does this look like overall in summary? This is my cheat sheet whenever I do any automation, right? Whether it be public cloud or with switches or with VPNs, right? So the first thing is unit tests are your config and your template validation. Anything you pass in, whether it be you know, commands, whatever you decide, make sure you just validate that it's good to go. That's what your unit tests tend to do. Use your favorite automation tool or linting program. Linting programs are useful. I like anything that's Ruby-based, but again, people get shudder at the thought of Ruby, so it's okay. Don't worry, whatever works for you. Output input certifications. Service contract tests are very specifically addressing this. It is really useful if you're building something a little custom and you're not sure what the output matches the input of what you expect. Who's made that mistake before? 
I've definitely done that. Uh, so functional validation is what you do during your integration test. Your integration tests will take a lot of overhead, right? You usually use a testing framework and a smoke test. And the idea is that you take that smoke test and you actually do it on the end to end. So during your staging or production, whatever you decide, during your end to end test, do your scripts or whatever to actually create whatever you need and then run the smoke test to make sure it actually works. Okay. Ship. What do I mean by shipping a network? Well, how do you get it to production, right? It's all good and well that you've tested it, you've created it locally. Now let's get it to production because it doesn't really mean much, right? So first thing to do when you ship your network, set the standards, norm on them. Think about names. Think very carefully about names because naming will get to you. Uh, design principles. Be very explicit about what they are. Um, one great example is that when I was with a client, no one knew whether or not an instance had to be deployed on a private domain or a public domain. And then no one knew which public domain went into prod versus staging versus dev. And it was crazy. So we had no standardization and we actually couldn't automate it because we had no standardization. And this was on public cloud, so theoretically we could have been able to automate it, right? Common template and code formatting, very important. There is, like I said, nothing more frustrating than looking at spaces versus tabs and then trying to figure out what happened when your friend is trying to figure out why your, a Python file won't commit, right? Um, so just make sure you agree on that. Testing and development setup. I actually, as part of a team norm that I have um, with a group of people and a client, uh, we have a team norm or a development setup norm that says everything is done in a container, which is interesting, right? Everything that we do against infrastructure is done in a container. So that's something we've implicitly agreed on. Event triggers. This is really important. Um, if you have manual, if you have not manual, but ticketing systems, right? Uh, and you need to submit tickets for incidents, you have to trigger them somehow. Agree on how you're triggering them because you'll have a lot of tools in the operations space and you'll need to figure out which ones you have to trigger first. <laughs> Finally, enforce the standards. Quality review, peer review, code. Treat your infrastructure just like code, right? No one needs to keep repeating it, but the idea is that quality review, pick two. I like to pick two people to do it. Linting programs are your best friend. Like I said, a lot, are, a lot of options in Python. You can build your own or you can use Ruby. Um, I like Food Critic for doing some linting on check cookbooks and stuff. Version control, Git, people have said it already. CI-CD framework, we're gonna go more into that on how you can use a CI-CD framework to enforce your standards. And documentation. When I say documentation, try readmes. Uh, usually wikis tend to get lost in the ether, so you don't know where it went, right? And you have to find the link. Put the readme or the documentation right with the code. So the idea is that treat it as if it's your own project and someone else has to pick it up. So when I talk about CI-CD, that usually inevitably leads to something else, right? The idea is that your CI-CD is supposed to detect when changes fail, right? So changes actually legitimately fail, whether it be automation, not automation, or manual. Changes fail because your patterns break. If someone actually coded in a static IP and they're not supposed to do that, then when you make a network change, the static IP is going to affect what happens, right? So changes fail when patterns break. The idea is that you need to then test for conformance. Test to make sure those patterns are not broken in the first place. That's the trick, and that's why you need a pipeline to help facilitate that, because there are a lot of tests, if you haven't noticed. And now I'm adding one more, the conformance test. All right, what's a pipeline? How many people actually know what a pipeline is? OK, some people do. Good. All right, I don't claim to know what a pipeline is because it's still a magical thing to me, right? But the true definition, as per Jazz Humble from Continuous Delivery, is a pipeline is an automated manifestation of your process from, for getting, from getting software from version control into the hands of your users. And your users are a little bit more abstract in the infrastructure space, but at the end of the day, they're application development teams, right? So what are two key focuses of the pipeline? A pipeline is a manifest. That is so important. It's a reflection of your expectations, of your design principles that you've agreed upon and then put it into that pipeline. Remember when I said conformance tests check for patterns that are broken? Well, 
your pipeline is a manifest to reflect that. It's now your architectural decisions that are in a nice coded pipeline. Second is control. From an auditability perspective, you can actually put a lot of control into your pipelines, whether that be manual approvals or something else. So let's take a look. When I need to ship anything, this is my template, my cheat sheet for pipelines. I usually put together about seven steps. And sometimes they flop depending on whatever infrastructure I'm doing. But I have unit tests, which are going to involve linting, unit test contract tests. That's kind of in the beginning. Make sure my configuration is good. Make sure it's not got spaces versus tabs versus someone named it .com versus .net, stuff like that. Build, that's actually the automation piece. Then I've got the test, a sec, well, a main test piece, and that usually is my smoke test. So on a public uh, cloud network, for example, we spun up a bunch of kitchen instances um, to determine if the actual uh, networking was actually properly configured and routed. So that was that test stage, for example. And finally, you've got conformance tests. Now, these are kind of optional, and they can run, be run asynchronously depending on how sophisticated you are with it. So security, monitoring, and performance. What do I mean by security? Well, that's pretty obvious. One thing is check to make sure you're not TCP all to all 000 slash zero, right? That's one thing that you would check for from a security standpoint. You would put in your pipeline. If you see it, nope, break. Don't go to production. Monitoring is another one. Let's say you've got a network, op uh, network operations monitoring tool you need to make sure the agent is turned on or the switch that you're configuring is actually sending information still to your network operations center. Well, that would be what your monitoring stage would be looking for. Then you've got your performance stage. Um, one great one is like, hey, I'm working on SDN and I see a slowdown. What's going on? Well, if you have a specific SLO or SLA, you want to make sure that it's still performant so that your users aren't impacted. So these can all go into a pipeline. This is what I mean by conformance. And finally, you deploy. And deploy can mean a lot of things, right? I mean, maybe the network's already out there, and you don't necessarily have additional steps. But deploy could be very useful to denote, denote that something's uh, production ready. Uh, I'll go into a little bit about deploy and how you can actually do additional stuff with deploy in particular. But the reality is that I usually tend to have these seven stages in my pipelines whenever I do it. And I try to make sure I include everything in each of them. So if you're looking at the example, there is actually a pipeline in it. Um, it's using GoCD. It's not using Jenkins, because I, I, Jenkins locally, I you know, struggle bringing it up. Um, and GoCD is a little bit easier to bring up locally. So GoCD, um, go check it out. It's just uh, another pipeline tool that you have to learn, but it's not that complicated. Um, I have a lint unit test, contract test. And since I'm not really deploying, it's hard to check for security on that toy example. It's also hard to check for performance and monitoring on it, because Anyway, it's a little complicated, but it's just got a lint unit test, contract test, and build and test stage. So you'll see that run through. So you can take a look at that. Run. So this is the last step of how to treat your network like a container. Well, run can mean a lot of things. It could mean upgrade, it could mean scale, it could mean secure. All of these could have their own talk. It's a lot of content, right? So I'm only going to focus on upgrade today. How can you upgrade your network? Upgrade, whether it be in place or blue-green, depends on risk and configuration. So it depends on risk appetite. Sometimes you don't want to be doing it in place, but you have to do it anyway. Um, and sometimes you might want to entertain the blue-green. Actually, when I first presented blue-green of networks, people, like, a, lo a lot of the network engineers that I was talking to thought I was crazy. Um, but Actually, it's more of a reality now that we have software-defined networking, and we have a lot more control over what we can do with our network. So let's take a look at what blue-green would look like for a network. And here's the given when then again. So in the connectivity space, given I have a container or software-defined network, when I need to upgrade that network, then I should create a new network with updated configuration and use it. Notice there's one caveat. It assumes no IP address affinity, uh, which is why container or software-defined networking works fairly well for it. It's very dynamic. Um, you should not be assuming a static IP address on a container or software-defined network. That will come back and bite you. So that's why I have to put that caveat there. So when you do the blue-green, make sure you have no IP address affinity. 
And this is what we've done, actually, with a public cloud network. So we had a blue network, and it had compute clusters on it. And we had to do some updating, updating of the underlying configuration. We didn't really want to touch the blue network, though, because that had live traffic to it. So we actually deployed our green network using our handy-dandy pipeline. And it was great, because we could see, OK, unit test, check, build, check, test. Check, it's secure, check, monitoring. It's feeding to our favorite network monitoring tool. Uh, performance, it's performant what we expect it to do. And then finally, we hit the deploy stage. And this is where the magic happened. The compute team, which also happened to be us, the compute team had a pipeline to deploy compute clusters. They had a compute pipeline that had unit tests, builds stages, testing stages, security, monitoring performance stages to deploy compute clusters. So what did we do? We did something called a deploy fan-out. So in pipeline nomenclature, you would say this is a fan-out. It fans out to another pipeline. So what happens when it fans out? Well, it would call our compute pipeline. The compute pipeline would then go through the sequence, right, unit, build, test, secure, monitor, et cetera, and deploy one compute cluster, which was our canary, onto the green network. And then the compute orchestrator, we shifted traffic, or shifted, I guess, the compute deployment. 50% of new clusters would go to the blue, and 50% would go to green. The idea is that by that point, they would both reach equal, equal clusters. OK, a little bit weird, but hang in there. So finally, we'd say, all right, well, you know, 100%, let's go to green. We know it's pretty stable. When we deploy workloads, we're not noticing any connectivity issues. We leave the blue up there. I mean, that was kind of determined by some of the SLOs that we've set with, from a business perspective. But we left that there for a little while. And then eventually, the deploy fan out would return back to our original network pipeline, because now it is production ready. And now it can tell the network orchestrator, or whatever my network orchestration tool might be, hey, remove that blue network. I think we're good to go. So that is how you can deploy a network using blue green. So at the end of all of this, well, what do I have to say? Networking is still challenging. Uh, I still work with network engineers, and it's still really difficult. Uh, I don't claim to be a network engineer, but I also don't claim to be an application developer by that token anyway. And it's just so challenging. You have to meld the two. But the reality is that invest in your tests. It seems like it's really tedious. It seems like it's really frustrating because you're trying to patch something or you're trying to mock something and you don't get how to do it, right? But invest the time to do it because it will save you later. And as a personal note on this one, I actually did this talk, a, vari a variation of this talk a couple months ago. And when I came back to it to kind of revise and build on the demo, my tests saved me. They actually did. They saved me a lot of time because, A, they reminded me what I did, and B, when I made changes to some of those really complex automation use pieces you saw, I didn't know I broke something. <laughs> so this was actually a great indicator to me that something was wrong. So having the tests actually saved me a lot of time now. And patterns and standards are useful. I say this as the last note because patterns and standards aren't something we think about right off the bat, but think about it this way. If you establish a pattern or a standard on a device that you cannot automate, that's currently manual, maybe you can automate it later on. And you've already enforced the patterns and standards, right? So it makes it so much easier to go back and automate it. So that way you get further along into that digital transformation spectrum to automation. How do you learn more? Well, this is the tricky part. I don't really know, other than to hack, right? Um, hack away at everything. Read a lot of examples. There are fantastic examples here at Cisco DevNet Create, and there are many examples online as well. So pick your favorite, you know, favorite you know, project or something and just look into it. See what happens. Repurpose some code. You're more than welcome to take some of my GitHub code and repurpose it for your own uh, features or testing that you so desire. Uh, that's the whole point. And I think the most valuable thing is befriending a network engineer or QA or dev. I was adopted by network engineers, and they taught me everything they knew about the network and how to approach it. And I felt like I needed to come back and give something back to them, right? Because I work with some of the best QAs and some of the best application developers that I've ever met. 
So coming back and actually befriending them and bringing all that information back is the best way for you to get started and get really in depth into understanding how to test your network. Thanks, and if you're interested, slides are at the QR code and link, and there's the GitHub again. Cool. All right. Questions? We have a mic, so. It's quiet today. Yes. Hi, Rosemary. Thanks for the, call, uh, for the presentation. Really good. Um, in terms of testing, uh, a lot of your focus is on the network layer. Um, as you start running those tests, um, how do you kind of address the I would say the upper layer issues, right? When you start looking at quality of service or maybe specific application ports and such, is that something that you start looking at or you just ignore that? Yes, that is a yes. <laughs> the answer, the, the short answer is yes. And it's a very, tr it's, it's difficult, right? So you've got something now, especially in the container networking space, service meshes are just, you know, big buzzword, right? Um, the idea is that you can control from the L7 layer what your traffic's gonna look like. And when I work with developers, they're like, we don't, we don't get it. Like, we don't understand this. Or even whenever we do uh, network plugins for container networking, they're like, I, I don't get how this is supposed to affect my application. Um, and a lot of that has started to become, they have to learn a little bit about it. Um, so a lot of that has been educating and enabling an application development team to understand the basics of how to administer to networks uh, basically above the network layer. Um, and that's really difficult. But on top of that, we also tend to write a lot of tests as well to cover that. Um, so we do a lot of reference implementation examples um, that demonstrate how those tests work. And within our pipelines, which is actually kind of a little weird, but um, we don't necessarily know what ports the application is going to be serving on. But what we will do is basically say, hey, we, reserve, we have set a standard upon you. We are giving you this as a service. You need to be able to expose your health endpoint on this port and this endpoint. And that's what we test. So we set a standard and they conform to that. Any other questions? Thanks for the talk. Uh, question is, um, your pipeline showed one branch. If you have a feature branch and you merge it in, at what point do you retest and how much do you do it? Because it breaks. Yes, yes. Great question. So. Um, I generally avoid doing feature branching on infrastructure. Uh, and the tricky part is that usually configurations tend to, on, on features tend to get a little isolated and it, it gets a little messy. So, but when I have done the feature branching on infrastructure, um, what you will do is basically um, you had your uh, unit tests, build, test, and that's pretty much all you start out with, right? You do your unit build and then your smoke test on that. Um, and that's when you say, okay, I passed my smoke test, maybe it's ready to merge. Uh, that's when the security monitoring and performance stages, they tend to be more production related. So, and they tend to actually require a lot of resource as well. So those you can omit, but you can also generally do the unit um, build and smoke tests for, feet, your, for your branches actually. Um, it depends on how much of that resource you have. Otherwise, it's basically unit test, and that's about as good as you can get. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Well, then. We're ending a little early. I'll give you time back. Um, I'll definitely be, I guess, outside uh, since there's another session in here. But thank you very much. Any feedback, feel free to DM me. Awesome. Thank you, Rosemary. All right, coming up at five, we have uh, Mandy Whaley coming in to talk about uh, Murray Curie, uh, open source, Kickstarter, and women in tech. So please join us in about a half hour, and uh, it'll be great. <laughs>